Okay, so I'm going to uh, get the meeting started. Uh, before we call the meeting to order, um, we're going to start with a public meeting. Um, I'm not sure if um, uh, Ms. Mrs. Kennedy would like to do an introduction to the public meeting. Um, it's uh, the, starting at 5 p.m. on April 24th today. Uh, to consider the tax write-offs pursuant to section 357 and 358 of the Municipal Act 2001. Um, Mrs. Kennedy, do you have anything to kind of add to the uh, public meeting? No, I don't. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So seeing that there's no members of the public here, uh, I will uh, will close the meeting and I will call the meeting to order. Uh, can I get an approval of the agenda? Uh, Councillor Osanic, seconded by Councillor Schell, um, call the vote. All those in favor, that passes unanimously. Um, are there any errors, omissions, or amendments to be made to the confirmation or, or regarding uh, last meeting's minutes? Uh, seeing none, I'll call for a mover. Uh, Councillor Schell, seconded by Councillor Osanic, I'll call to vote. That passes unanimously. Um, there, do we have any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, um, we have no delegations, no briefings. We have three business items today, uh, taxes, taxes, and patios. Um, um, the first one, tax write-offs pursuant to the Municipal Act 2001. Could I please get an introduction from staff? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the uh, tax write-off report, um, uh, the committee has seen these reports, they come periodically in terms of uh, approval of some of the write-offs. The, uh, there's only four amounts on the exhibit uh, for this report, um, and the main one is uh, 945 Gardner's Road. That is the uh, Catarockway Town Centre. Um, and relates to all the, uh, the, the time that all the renovations were happening in around the food court and, and uh, sport check and in that wing of the center. So, um, so we are canceling some taxes here for the unusable portion of that. Um, and then we will see a supplementary coming back on uh, uh, in the future. Thank you. Do we have any uh, questions from the committee? Seeing none, do we have any uh, questions from members of public? Um, do we have a mover to put the uh, recommendation on the floor? Councillor uh, Osanic, seconded by Councillor Stroud. Um, do we have any uh, comments regarding the, the uh, motion, recommendation? Seeing none, um, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Uh, and that passes unanimously. Um, Moving on to business item B, could I get a, uh, another introduction from staff? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the second report that we have on the agenda is the 2017 tax ratios and tax capping parameters. Uh, and these are the numbers that will then be used in terms of calculating the final tax bill that will be coming to, uh, uh, the tax rates that will be coming to council later on in May. Um, so there's two parts to this report, just kind of give you a, a bit of a summary as to uh, what's in here. The first part is the uh, property class tax ratios. Uh, and the tax ratios, as you'll recall, are what we use to distribute the tax burden across the property taxes. Um, and there's a couple of things in there that are, are different from last year. The first one is our multi-residential properties. Um, and you'll remember we had a 10-year reduction plan on our multi-res properties that we've been working through. Uh, 2017 would be our 10th year, which would have brought them down to 2.1, which was our objective over the 10 years to get down to 2.1. Um, however, there's been some provincial legislation that came out last fall in the 2016 uh, fall economic statement. Um, that has required us to reduce that ratio below the 2.1 that, that we initially were aiming for. Um, so the first amount that was provincially legislated uh, was to bring it down so that there was, there, was there was no effect of the reassessment on these properties. So they saw a large increase from the, uh, the, the new four-year reassessment. 
Um, so uh, to offset that assessment, we had to bring it back to about 2.02, .02, so that, that's something that we had no say on. Um, and then we had to bring it down to uh, two, it had to be two or below two, in order to prevent a levy restriction. So a levy restriction is where if our ratio is too high, we can't pass on the municipal budget increase. And uh, that's one of the policies that, that Council's had for a number of years, is that we don't want to run into a levy restriction. We want to be able to pass on basically our 2.5% budget increase. So to do that, um, the province said we had to bring it down to 2. So you'll see in the report where we've showed the two steps down to get us from where we were in 2016 and down to the 2.0 for the multi-res. Um, the other one that you'll see in there uh, in terms of the tax ratios is the farm ratio. Uh, and we were previously working actually with Councillor Allen before, uh, before he resigned um, with respect to addressing some of what's happened with the farming community, uh, again, because of the reassessments. And you'll see in there we've done some research around what other municipalities have um, in terms of reducing their ratio, uh, a negligible effect on the other classes because the farm class is so small compared to our other property classes. Uh, but we are recommending in terms of addressing that reassessment that over the four years, we reduce it down from uh, 0.25, which is what they're at now, to 0.2 um, over that four-year period. And that works out, I think it's about 14 cents on an average residential property. So those are the two uh, tax ratio changes in the report. Um, you'll also see the second section is the capping parameters. Uh, and we've got a couple of things in there, again, um, trying to stay within our objective of trying to get properties out of the capping as quickly as we can, get them moving to the fair market value as quickly as we can. And again, the province has provided a couple of new opportunities for getting, getting the properties out of the classes in 2017. Um, and so we're looking for approval to, to use those opportunities as well as the opportunities that they gave us in 2016. So you may not recall, but a year ago there were also some new ones that were available, but when we were here in front of the committee, we didn't have the legislation yet to, to do those. Um, so we decided not to do them. And we got, just from a timing standpoint, in 16, we'd like to pick those up as well as options to use in 17. So again, just looking for approval to, to use whatever the province is making available to us to try to move uh, the properties to their, uh, their current value assessment as quickly as we can. Very good. Thank you for that. Uh, do we have any questions from the committee? Uh, Councillor Stroud. Thank you. Just to go back to the table on page 15 of the report, or page 9 of the report, page 15 in the package, about what you were saying about the tax shift for the farmland re reduction. So that bottom uh, row where it says farm tax ratio reduction tax shift under residential, that's the extra burden assumed by each residential uh, taxpayer, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So it increases um, slightly each year to be 20 cents. Is that a cumulative increase or a, uh, a net from where we are now? That would be a net. It's not cumulative. Yeah. Okay. So it would be 14 cents and then 16 and then 19. Yeah. Right. So ending up at 20 cents uh, and that's a year? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So that is minimal. Okay. Thank you. Any uh, Councillor Shell. Uh, thank you. Um, just to check about the multi-residential, that's, is it, I thought I read in there that it's multi-residential multi is 1991 and before, and then after that it's new multi-res, or was I wrong? Okay, so, so after 2001, if they're built up to 2001, they would go into the new multi-res class, which is at a residential rate. Okay, thank you. And um, the farm, I, I remember hearing about this, that, that farms are starting to sell for big dollars. But the zoning remains the same for the farms. Is there any hint that people are starting to buy up land and speculating? I mean, I know you gave some reasons, but I mean, it is kind of worrisome that farmers are actually finding it difficult to buy 
uh, land, small farmers. So is there any thought that there's speculation going on? So there, I think there is some thought that that might be happening. Um, but in terms of how it's valued by MPAC, uh, they look at farm-to-farm -farm sales. So they don't look at somebody that's bought up the farm to do something else with it other than farming. Um, they only look at farm-to-farm -farm sales in terms of, of calculating that value. It's a supplementary, then farm-to-farm -farm means no zone change. They don't actually look at who buys it and if they're going to keep it, say, in pasture or cattle when you talk about farm-to-farm. -farm. Yeah, so it would be somebody that's buying it to farm it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great, thanks. Any further questions? Uh, seeing none, I'll ask uh, members of the public if they have any questions. Mr. Dixon? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, reading through the report, I think it's uh, very thorough work, so I want to thank staff and uh, the consultants employed for that. I do have uh, three questions that are maybe more in sort of the bigger picture or you know, uh, possible you know, sort of future where we're going on this. Um, I'm wondering if there are any further Queens Park mandated uh, responsibilities coming to Kingston that are going to be ha have to dealt with in this term of council. So that's the first question, uh, up until the end of November of next year. Um, I see on page 16 that you have uh, a category for um, actual pipeline considerations. And there's been um, some work done on possibly having more pipelines and or pipelines with greater flow coming through the area um, just as uh, a matter of getting the, the, the material to market, this sort of thing. There's been various hearings um, going on with that. So just wondering um, how that may impact the future uh, for Kingston since we do have pipelines that go through um, our area. And um, you're just talking about the impact um, aspect I'm, 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 I just want to sort of get it uh, clear in my mind that um, in Kingston, we deal with the current evaluation of property when we're dealing with uh, civic tax, as opposed to Toronto, for example, where they seem to have a, a major lag or undervaluing of the actual value of the property when the tax is applied. Thank you. Mrs. Kennedy. Through you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, making notes, make sure I get all three of them here. So, the first one in terms of Queen's Park regulations, I have no idea. Um, if my crystal ball would work that way, then, then that would be awesome. But uh, um, we tend to, to find these things out at the last minute. So, is there anything else within this term of council? We have no idea. I can tell you with respect to the report um, on the multi residential. Uh, there is a working group right now uh, of which um, Jeff Walker, our manager of taxation, myself are sitting in on those conference calls with the province and with a number of other municipalities. The province is looking at the multi-res um, and I think I probably would be safe to say there is more to come on that. Uh, I think what they have done bringing us down to, to 2 or to the 2.02 this year um, across the province was really just addressing this year. And as you can see in the report where we've showed the effect for multi res if they we've shown this year's effect if they do nothing over the next three years then the multi-res properties are getting hit with that huge uh, reassessment so they've only fixed it or put a band-aid on for one year so I expect that from this working group and uh, from what the review that the province is doing there'll be more in that regard um, the pipeline category um, again I don't know what the effects of that would be I, I'm not familiar with what's happening I think Pat might Go ahead, Pat might be able to help in terms of what goes into that category in terms of taxation. So if uh, more pipes are added, that's a supplementary assessment and it would be reflected, yes. So any new addition uh, to uh, a property that is not on the returned roll for a year's taxation is put on as supplementary assessment under the Assessment Act and additional revenues would come to the municipality. Yep. So through you, Mr. Chair, just your third question, I'm not sure I quite understood what you were asking, but you were talking about the valuation method 
and, and what would be used here versus, say, in Toronto. So the valuation process and, and the methodology is done by MPAC, um, and that's a consistent methodology right across the province. Um, so it shouldn't vary that much. I mean, I, I mean, getting down into there may be some differences in terms of, of area that are built into the methodology, but in terms of using cost or an income method in, in regards to the commercial um, assessment, that's the same methodology across the whole province. I don't see why not. Yeah, well, thanks very much for those answers. Uh, very informative. Um, I guess with the first question, what I had in mind was um, things that Queen's Park has decided that you know could be coming before the end of this term of council. Uh, you, know, you, you, you know, what you explained was very good, right? So that was sort of how I uh, met the question. Um, because you were saying that you, you were adjusting to what Queen's Park was mandating for Kingston. So, you know, very good there. Um, my question with the pipeline, uh, and thank you for the answer for that, had more to do with the possible increased flow in the same pipelines as well as more pipelines being added. So what I was wondering was, if the pipeline flow is increased, does that lead to more taxation revenue for Kingston? Okay, and then uh, again, you know, with the third question, um, I didn't really maybe explain this very well, but I believe that the City of Toronto Act and maybe other measures allow Toronto to not tax certain areas of the city based on their current impact value. They're taxed at a lower rate. So what I wanted to learn was, you know, if that applies in Kingston, you have a, an, act, an actual impact valuation for the property and then it is taxed at that rate. There's no exceptions, right? Okay, thanks. With respect to the pipeline issue, um, the rates are set by the province on how the uh, amount is calculated and it's on the size of the pipe, not what flows through the pipe. Okay. Okay, so uh, now I will um, look for a mover for the motion. Uh, do I have a, do I have a mover? Councillor Shell, Councillor Osanic. Um, do we have any discussion on the uh, recommendation? Uh, seeing none, um, we will call to vote. All those in favor? That passes unanimously. Uh, moving on to uh, business item number C, uh, business item C, uh, sidewalk patio operating season review. Uh, could I please get an introduction from staff? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm Kim Brown, and I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development with the Engineering Department. And one of the uh, items of our portfolio in that area is the sidewalk patio licenses. So further to a uh, motion of council, staff, uh, staff went out and undertook some information, uh, pardon me, information finding as it related to extending the season uh, to the month of November, and we also included uh, in our research the month of March. Uh, we have before you a information report because the outcome of our research with the downtown businesses was not necessarily as extensive as we had hoped, and we felt that there was a possibility that some of the businesses in the downtown core may not have given enough consideration, so we're proposing to go to their business um, semi-annual business meeting later in May. Um, of important to note is through the staff information at this point and some of the concerns that were raised by our public works department as it relates to maintenance as well as um, liability possibilities within the, within the area. So I can take any questions at this point. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Stroud. Thank you and thank you for the detailed report. Uh, first question, small one, just about the exact amount of the one-time fee that would be 
recommend, it said staff would, this is on page 33, staff would however recommend that there be a fee assessed to any patio operator for the amendment of their license to add months to the agreement in the same fashion that there is a fee for any new operator taking on a license. In other words, a one-time fee to change the license to, to have extended time if we go that route. What would the amount of that fee be? Through you. Uh, the current fee is, uh, I believe, about $200 for us to uh, proceed with all of the documentations that, ne that would be necessary to modify the agreements, as well as uh, consideration for the cost for legal. And I believe their fee may be in the $200 range as well. Okay. And on the subject of cost, maybe we could, uh, because it's, it's not in the report, but I know from speaking to some business owners, the, the annual fee for a patio license ca can be considerable, and I was wondering if you could give us some detail on how that fee is calculated and what uh, that amounts, th those amounts are uh, on, on, for some of these patios. Through you, I can attempt to explain how this is calculated. It's actually quite interesting and it's um, described fully in our, in our bylaw. There's four zones in the area. So the parties that are, the properties that are down by the lake have a higher per square meter rate than the properties that are up in the Division Street area. And the zones are um, reflected in the BIA's uh, area. Uh, there's a cost associated with the square meter of the patio, like licensed patio area, but there's also a cost associated with the removal of on-street parking. So if there are parking stalls that are removed as a result of uh, an application, then we take that value, however many stalls are removed, and multiply it by the rate that our parking staff provide us for an annual space, and then that's, um, the main value, we then would uh, assess whether or not there's an area cost in addition. And the area cost would only be in addition if the area of the patio is larger than the area of the spaces that was taken up by the parking. So some patio operators may just pay into the parking reserve fund with the, because of the elimination of parking. Others who are using public space that was already in place because there were locations where the, pad, the sidewalk was already extended and so they, they were able to take advantage, they would just be paying a square meter fee. Sorry, uh, I don't know, we're probably running out of questions here, but the, uh, what about in the, in the situation of patios that are outside of the BIA? Are they calculated differently as well? Uh, we have no applications for on-street patios outside the BIA area. So this is only specific to patio licenses that are using city sidewalk. And outside of the BIA, we've had no applications. And those parties that have put in patios have all been on private property. So for, just to use an example, the Grad Club uh, at the corner of Barry and Union is the private property. They don't pay a permit fee for their patio? Uh, you, yes, they do. They actually pay, f I'm sorry, I forgot about the Grad Club having a patio. And they do. Um, but they pay the, the D zone rate, which is the lowest rate. Okay, so if there was another area, another uh, location that wanted to add a patio that was on their own property, it would be similar to the Grag Club. And if they were taking up <clears throat> street or parking or public or uh, sidewalk or anything like that, then it would be a, an increased cost. Right. So, yeah, and, and, and that can get complicated. I, I, I need, I just, I'm asking these questions because I field these questions often and I have no idea what to say. So, thank you. Um, I'll let maybe my colleagues go. I do have a, a, a different uh, aspect I wanted to to get into later, but I'm gonna I'm gonna pass for now. Thank you, Councillor Stroud. Do we have any other questions, uh, Councillor Shell? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So what I kind of got out of the report is that this is for information. There's there's going to be further study, um, and I got the impression that 
we are kind of leaning toward maybe half of March and half of November if the details of the further surveys warrant it. That's sort of the, the feel of the report. <laughs> Through you, I would agree that that's probably where we're trying to head to. We have significant concern about the um, potential for winter events mm -hmm. and by providing a blanket agreement to extend the season from the beginning of March to the end of November, uh, based on even this past March, it would, it would be problematic if we were just to leave it as a blanket, yes, you may go, and leave it up to the operators to be frugal or prudent in watching the weather and trying to get things out of the way so that we could complete operations properly as well as um, Public Works does have also additional concerns as it relates to trying to do maintenance on anything that may be within the, the confines of a patio. And it, it does, well, some restaurants just put up a fence and put chairs out, and then others it becomes quite elaborate. They build a platform and put the chairs up. So I presume we, we will need a bylaw that just covers everybody. Um, I don't get, see in this that staff are sort of leaning to, well, if you've had to do major construction to put up your patio, you know, we're, we're going to look at you one way and people that just put up a fence a different way. You're trying to treat everyone as a whole. Through you, my recommendation would be that we would keep everything consistent and all operators would be addressed in the same fashion. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Stroud. Yeah, so it's, it's related to what Councillor Shell was just asking, the, um, the winter, con winter events. So obviously, I mean, even if uh, in, in the event that we allowed uh, shoulder season to be open, for example, March, or St. Patrick's Day, or November, because there's lots of mild days in November, say, say we, we did it, we, we know that the patio operators will only be interested in opening the patio on nice days. So obviously on a day where there might be a winter event, they could get caught if they had a nice day and opened in November and then they, did, they left everything out. The, the risk is that they would interfere with sidewalk clearing uh, because all of the, that elaborate stuff that they put out is still there. And I'm just wondering if there's any way we could, rather than having to gamble on the weather and monitor weather, we could write it into the agreement that if there is a weather event, there equipment has to be removed or they, or, you know, as part of the agreement. That way you're not so much, um, it, it, you're taking away the risk because if there is a, a winter event, they know they have to dismantle their stuff. Through you, uh, we certainly would envision uh, clause amendments inside their agreements for their license of the, of the public space and that would speak to a uh, winter event and that their responsibility would be to remove. The concern, I think, is that uh, who makes that judgment on whether it's a significant enough event, uh, whether or not there's going to be, um, you know, it's the, the climate change in, from one day to another is, is un, not always predictable. So it would be better if the city potentially issued that date that has to happen. And then it just, it just removes the patios at that time. And we would then um, not have that risk of one person possibly not getting their patio down in time. I okay, it, so, it sounds like staff prefers to have a set date, but there's not really a uh, strict justification for that. Thank you. Any more questions from the committee? No, I'll ask for questions from uh, the public. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think this was some very good work done. I know this has been talked about um, among restaurant operators in the downtown quite a bit. And the report is dealing with the sidewalk patios. We, we have potential interaction between snow plows and this sort of thing when you have winter events, as we're just discussing. 
Um, I think I'd be in favor of extending the season by half a month in each direction. Um, and then be measuring how that works out and then also checking to see um, when the winter events have occurred the last few years. We know that the uh, winters are getting milder and shorter. And uh, I just have one question. Uh, I'm not sure if it's covered in the report, but uh, there are also some patios on rooftops in Kingston. And obviously, if they're there, they're not going to interfere with uh, winter control uh, measures. So would these uh, rules apply to them as well, or is that a separate category, or whatever? And I guess there's other, um, uh, as Councillor Straub was talking about, like I said, with the grad club, uh, there are other uh, patios that, that are kind of on front yards. Um, not like I'm thinking about the mansion, for example, right? So they have a patio there that's in operation. So um, not in the BIA. Uh, it's in Williamsville District, but so is that that, that category also covered? Thank you. Through you, uh, the patios that we're speaking about are only patios that are licensing municipal sidewalk space. Any patio that is on private property falls under either site plan or building code or or just generally their own use of their own property. The city doesn't have any involvement, the, this bylaw does not have any involvement with those. Thank you, any further, oh, so uh, well, I guess I'll ask for a uh, mover to receive the information report. Uh, Councillor Bohm, seconded by Councillor Schell. Um, any further discussion? Uh, seeing none, I'll ask for, uh, I'll call to vote uh, to, oh, or sorry. Um, okay, I'll call to vote. Uh, all those in favor to receive the information report. That passes unanimously. Um, we have no other motions. We have no, do we have any notices of motion? Uh, seeing none, we have no other business, no correspondence. Our next meeting is, for admin policies, is scheduled for Thursday, May 11th, 2017. And I'll uh, ask for a motion to adjourn. Councillor Bohm, seconded by Councillor Stroud. Councillor Sand? Yeah, Mr. Chair, aren't, to the clerk, aren't we doing bi-monthly meetings? So now it is back to monthly meetings? Well, this meeting is a special meeting uh, to consider the um, for finance, that's we had to get everything in here on time, uh, and due to um, some errors on my part, we didn't have the meeting last week, and I apologize to staff and to members of the committee for that. Um, but yeah, this is a special meeting. Our meeting next month will go ahead. There's business for it, uh, and then after that, we'll return to the bi-monthly schedule. So we are adjourned.